Mr. Justice Tom Cromwell, Professor Trevor Farrell, Ms. Emma Halpern, and President Dan Campbell. What a lineup. I would come to see any of them speak independently, but to put the four into one panel, inspired. We are without question in for a treat. Welcome to the Schulich School of Law. We're delighted that you're able to join us here this evening or this afternoon, and we're delighted to be hosting this year's FB Wickwire Memorial Lecture in Professional Responsibility and Legal Ethics with the Nova Scotia Barristers Society. I'm Kim Brooks, the Dean at the school. I'm delighted that this lecture, named in honor of Ted Wickwire, the man who received his LLB degree here in 1962, is still housed here at the school. First, the lecture honors a man who worked tirelessly to ensure that lawyers maintained a level of uncompromised professionalism. We are fittingly proud of his contributions to the Legal Academy the university, and the profession. You can read more about those contributions on your invitation card. Second, this lecture reflects an ongoing relationship between the school and the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. Speaking for the school, that relationship is one that enhances significantly the richness of our program and people, and it informs daily our understanding of law, legal education, and the legal profession. Finally, let me say that I'm proud to have a lecture that focuses on professional responsibility and legal ethics here at the faculty. We house the leading scholars in this country on this substantive topic, with the exception, of course, of Osgood, which houses Trevor Farrow, <laughs> within our far too leaky walls of the school. Our students have had a required course on this topic for years and discuss issues of ethics and professionalism pervasively during their time at the school. Without more than let me turn the floor over to Dan Campbell, to the panel, thank you. To the audience, enjoy. Thank you, Dean Brooks. I suppose I have the second easiest job after uh, Richard's. And thank you, thank you all for coming. This is a wonderful turnout to honor Ted Wickwire and to hear uh, three uh, very uh, eminent and interesting speakers. It's fitting that we hold this annual lecture to honor Ted Wickwire, who contributed so much to our profession. I remember Ted uh, as one of the lawyers I looked up to as, as a very young lawyer. He was a, a skillful advocate, an elegant advocate, uh, always well prepared, always scrupulously fair, always sound in judgment. But in addition to his professional skill, he had a dedication to professionalism, to service, and to ethics. And the biographical note in your program sets out just some of the ways that he served uh, his community and his profession. Most pertinent to the topic of our, our lecture today, he led the development of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society Handbook on Ethics and Professional Conduct, and he contributed greatly to the establishment of the Ethics and Professional Conduct program here at, uh, well, at what was then Dalhousie Law School. Ted would have been very interested in the topic we're discussing today, he had a great interest in access to justice, although that's not a phrase that we used much back then. He was a leader of the Bar Society's volunteer legal program in the days before legal aid, and he was the first chair of the Legal Aid Commission. So I'm delighted to welcome you to these presentations by three distinguished speakers on a topic that would have been of great interest to the man that we're honoring. Our speakers today are Justice Tom Cromwell of the Supreme Court of Canada, Ms. Emma Halpern, Equity Officer of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, and Professor Trevor Farrow of Osgoode Hall Law School of York University. Brief biographical note is in your program, so we'll dispense with, with introductions. I'll call first on Justice Cromwell, who is, is well known to us from his fondly remembered days in this building and on the bench of our Court of Appeal. And in addition to his day job now at the Supreme Court of Canada, Justice Cromwell is Chair of the Action Committee on the access to civil and family justice. Justice Cromwell.
Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I don't think I've ever heard Richard speak better. I don't know. Um, I think it was Richard that when I was appointed to the Court of Appeal from the law faculty quipped that my appointment had enriched the intellectual atmosphere of both places. <laughs> so I've owed him one for a long time. Anyway, let me just first of all uh, add a word to what uh, President Campbell said about uh, Mr. Rickwire. He, of course, was a very senior uh, and prominent lawyer when I was a very junior and far from prominent law professor in this building. And he treated everyone with tremendous uh, respect and at least feigned interest in everyone's opinions. I'm sure he was feigning interest in mine, but he really had a manner of engaging with people that was tremendous, regardless of their status in the legal hierarchy. He was, of course, a huge supporter of Dalhousie, serving for many, many years on our Board of Governors. And he was a huge supporter of the law school. And I think of Ted particularly in connection with our efforts in the, in the mid-1980s to try to bring the faculty to give more attention to the subject of professional responsibility. And Brent Cotter and I helped organize a conference in this room uh, on that subject. And Ted Wickwire was a big supporter and really encouraged us in our efforts to have, uh, have more emphasis on that area of teaching and scholarship in the, in the law faculty. And I think his, his support and influence was very important. And as Dan said, it may have been that Ted Wickwire did not use the words access to justice as such, but he certainly lived them uh, through his work with legal aid and through his uh, insistence on the highest standards of professional conduct. So it's a tremendous honor to have known him in the first place and of course a huge honor to have been invited to take part in this uh, lecture series in his memory. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I've discovered after I guess almost 15 years as a judge that normally judges are treated with considerable uh, respect and even occasionally with deference, but there are some sometimes humorous exceptions. And for example, there was a young lawyer who uh, was arguing a rather obvious point in court and the judge grew impatient. He said, you know, you don't need to keep going over that. He said, I'm not a complete idiot. And the young counsel who was a little taken aback said, I'm sorry, my lord, I didn't realize that. <laughs> Then there was the uh, plaintiff in a uh, defamation action and her counsel was leading her through her evidence and said, now I'd like you to repeat exactly what the defendant said. And the woman sort of blushed and said, it really isn't something that should be said to a respectable person. Counsel said, then just whisper it to the judge. <laughs> so sometimes it has its amusing moments. Um, I'd like to kick this discussion on access to justice off by touching very uh, quickly on four points. First of all, just to say a word about what is access to justice. How would we, how would we know if we had it? Uh, second of all, I'm going to suggest three key components to any approach to improving access to justice. I'm going to report very, very briefly on some of our work in the Action Committee on access to civil and family justice and then conclude with a couple of remarks about what the academy and the practicing bar uh, might be able to do to help the situation. And I promise that none of that is going to take more than about 12 or 15 minutes because I know Dan has got the stopwatch running in the hook ready. And uh, having appeared before our court recently and had to sit down when the red light came on, I know he's up for retaliation. <laughs> I don't even have the amber light to warn me here. But anyway, first of all, so what is access to justice? And I'm concentrating on uh, family and civil justice. And I think we could put it into a sentence that people would have uh, sufficient access to justice if they had the knowledge, the resources, and the services to deal effectively with civil and family legal matters. And so I think, although that's a short sentence, there's, I think, quite a bit in it. But I'd just like to highlight the fact that this is not a court-centric or litigation-centric uh, vision of what is access to justice. It's not only about lawyers or only about litigation or only about courts. 
And you know, sometimes what's needed for access to justice is a babysitter or a bus pass, not a more uh, enriched uh, self-help program in the court. So I think we're trying to take a, a fairly broad view of what access to justice looks like and not trying to concentrate only on our formal processes, although of course they're vital and, and very important and central to uh, access to justice. Second of all then, to turn to what I would suggest are three key elements and I can see some of you are relieved that the first point only took 10, 10 or 15 seconds because I could see that you were thinking, this is going to be a long afternoon. But the three key elements, and this will be quick too, um, I would suggest there are three. One is engagement, the second is a strategic approach, and the third is a collaborative approach. And I'm just going to say a word about each. Engagement, I think, is, is critical. I think there are a lot of people very concerned about the state of access to justice in Canada, civil, family, criminal, all along the, the way, all across the board. But I think that what we, where we have a lot of work to do is getting engagement. And by engagement, I don't just mean wringing our hands collectively about it. By engagement, I mean asking ourselves, what can we do to improve access to justice? My experience pretty well across the country is that we're all really, really good at telling other people what they should be doing. The judges are really, really good at deciding that the government should do X, Y, and Z. And the government's quite good at telling the uh, judges what they should be doing, or sometimes where they should be going. And the, the practicing bar tends to agree with both. Um, but in any event, what I think is where we need a lot of work done is we need to get everybody sitting back and saying, well, there, there's a huge problem, it's a multi-sectoral problem, but what can we do in our sphere of influence and decision making? That's what I'm talking about uh, by engagement, not simply worrying about it, but actually starting to reflect on what we could do ourselves and what we could do in cooperation with others. Strategic approach, I had a, a, an excellent luncheon meeting over at the Bar Society uh, today, and one of the expressions that was used, you know, this, this topic is a sinkhole. We could pour everything we have into this, and still there'd be a hole. And so I think I completely agree with the people who say what we need is a strategic approach. We need to identify some key things and do that, and let other things go by the boards, because it's such a huge topic that we really could spend all of our energy and all of our resources uh, from now until the end of time and perhaps not feel we'd accomplish much. So I think a more strategic approach is very important. And then finally, collaboration. This is something that I think is really big and needs to be worked on a lot in the, in the justice system particularly and beyond. That, uh, as I mentioned before, I think we're all really good at diagnosing what other people are doing wrong. But we need to be, you know, the old physician heal thyself. I think we need to be looking at what we can do and then how we can work together. We still have a lot of silos in the justice system. And those silos have to be broken down or they at least have to communicate and collaborate uh, more effectively. So those are my three key elements of a strategy to approach access to justice. Turning to my third point about the action committee on a uh, access to civil and family justice. This was set up by Chief Justice McLaughlin. And uh, as I like to say, I was uh, invited uh, to chair it when I joined the Supreme Court. And I'm glad that I was because it's been a tremendous learning experience for me. What we have is a, a fairly high level national committee that's representative of just about every sector in the justice community. Uh, along with the member of the public. So we have a couple of deputy ministers, uh, a couple of judges from both the federal and provincial systems. We have public legal education people, we have legal aid, we have um, court administration, we have uh, legal scholars, uh, Professor Farrow being our, uh, our action committee scholar in residence. And uh, so we really have, uh, we have the pro bono people at the table. So we have a lot of experience around the table. And our job as we see it is to really try to foster that 
collaboration, that engagement, and that strategic approach throughout the justice system. We've set up uh, four working groups to correspond to what we've identified as four priority areas for work in the area of civil and family justice. And those four uh, working groups are these. Access to legal services. N I think number one on just about anybody's uh, hit parade of things that we need in terms of improved access to justice that we need to get more uh, people in touch with lawyers. Um, you know, and in, in we talk about all the strategies we have for self-represented people. We talk about all the strategies we have to assist people with their legal issues. And all of that's important, and I'm not in any way taking away from it. But you know, when there's a famine in the world, we don't advertise that we're going to teach these people to eat less. You know, we don't, that's not our main strategy. And I don't think that's our main strategy either in the area of people who need legal services. And so we have a very strong working group uh, chaired by Mark Benton, who's the executive director of the Legal Services Society in British Columbia. Uh, uh, stick handling that group. We have strong representation from the Federation of Law Societies, who has now also set up a committee on this subject. We have strong representation from the Canadian Bar, and so on. So a very important area. Second priority area, court processes simplification. Uh, and we feel here that there are lots of things that could be done, probably without rule changes in most cases, to simplify and streamline people's experiences in the court. And if we can make a, a lawyer's bill for one hour instead of four to deliver the same service, we think that would be a contribution to access to justice. Third area, access to family justice. This seems to be a priority for just about everybody across the country. Some judges have told me that 70% of the people appearing before them in family matters are self-represented. Uh, so we've got lots of, lots of issues there. And fourthly, uh, a working group on what we're calling triage, prevention, and referral. And the idea of this group is to look at how we can initially get people to the services that they most need. Legal problems don't tend to come in isolation from other problems, and often legal problems are grouped uh, together. And so there's a lot of work being done on how we can more effectively get the person uh, to the services they need in a sensible order. Uh, and prevention, a lot of times there may be ways to avoid the legal problem in the first place, and we need to, to think more creatively about it. So those are our four priority areas. Each one has a strong working group. The first two groups, the access to legal services and the court process simplification, have been running for about 18 months, and they're going to do their final reports to our action committee meeting this June. The other two working groups, the family justice and the triage prevention referral, have just started over the last three or four months, and they'll be working to a June uh, 2013 uh, time limit. So uh, I hope you'll be hearing quite a bit more about especially those first two working groups later uh, into the summer and into next fall. So can I just close these opening remarks then with a couple of thoughts about what the university and the legal profession, the bar, can do uh, and indeed are doing to, to help us improve access to justice. When we think about the university, I, I think we still believe that universities are built on the three pillars of teaching, research, and service. And we really don't need to say much at the Schulich School of Law about how the law school can contribute to access to justice in each of those three areas. In the teaching, we certainly, I think, need more academic work on what is access to justice, what are the lessons of the past, uh, how does professional responsibility relate to access to justice, and what careers are available, what innovative ways of practicing may exist that will help provide young new lawyers with a, a good livelihood, but will also make legal services more accessible to their community. So that's just a, an example of the kinds, some of examples I should say, of the kinds of things that can be done in the teaching area. 
research. We certainly need lots more action-oriented uh, quantitative research about our, our justice system and particularly our civil justice system. And I know that Professor Farrow will be saying a word or two about a huge research project that he's involved with on the cost of justice. And there's tons of room uh, for work in just about every area of how our legal system actually functions. And at Dalhousie, again, we certainly don't need to say anything about service. I see Donna Franey uh, here in the front uh, row. Dalhousie has a long and proud history uh, of service to the community, actually providing legal services. And there's lots of room uh, for that. I know Pro Bono Students Canada is active on the campus at the Schulich School of Law. Those are the kinds of things that I think law faculties can make a very meaningful contribution to access to justice through service to others. Uh, as for the bar, it, it seems to me that there is a professional responsibility element to the access to justice uh, topic and that that operates at two levels. I think there's a sort of an operational level of that professional responsibility and that's where we talk about things such as pro bono, trying to perform legal services in a more cost-effective manner, uh, etc. But there's also a more systemic uh, side to the professional responsibility and that's working uh, within the profession and cooperatively with other players in the justice system to improve things. And I noted that you have recently adopted new, a new code of professional conduct in, in Nova Scotia. And I was interested that in the new Article 4.06, it stated that a lawyer must encourage public respect for and try to improve the administration of justice. And in the commentaries, it's noted that a lawyer by training, opportunity, and experience is in a position to observe the workings and discover the strengths and weaknesses of laws, legal institutions, and public authorities. A lawyer should therefore lead in seeking improvements in the legal system, but any criticisms and proposals should be bona fide and reasoned. And I know that, that from our lunch discussions that Emma will be telling you about some of the exciting things that the Nova Scotia Bar uh, is doing in this area. So uh, I'm very gr glad to have had the chance to be here to tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do in the Action Committee and uh, to meet you and I know that Trevor and Emma will add quite a lot to our reflections on the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Cromwell. Uh, Emma Halpern is the equity officer of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. She works with our Gender Equity Committee and our Racial Equity Committee and has recently undertaken to coordinate our work in the, in the general area of uh, access to justice. In my time on the executive of, of the Bar Society, I've uh, come to admire Emma's work. She brings to her work uh, uh, enthusiasm, yay, passion, uh, and energy and knowledge. Uh, so we'll look forward to her discussion of the work that she's been undertaking and what we've been finding. Hi. Wow. <laughs> Sitting up front, you don't realize quite how many people are here. There are seats up here, too. I know there's a few people up against the wall. There's empty seats. If you want to move up. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for the honor of uh, in, be, being invited to participate in the annual Wickwire Memorial Lecture. I've been racking my brains all day trying to figure out how I ended up in the daunting position of having to follow Justice Cromwell, who is not only brilliant, but also extremely funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> true. <laughs> So here you are with me, who I was about to say isn't very funny, but hey, I got you to laugh. <laughs> and um, I'm hopeful that really what I can do is give you a bit of a picture of some of the access to justice, or more specifically, access to legal services work happening on the ground here in Nova Scotia. So as in other regions of Canada, the legal system, and specifically legal services in Nova Scotia, have become increasingly more difficult to access over the past number of years. 
Studies in Nova Scotia on the topic of self-representation and the provision of pro bono services have indicated that frontline court staff are seeing a greater number of self-represented litigants and local community organizations are fielding a significant increase in questions relating to the law. The Legal Information Society of Nova Scotia has noted an increase over the last few years in the number of callers who, self who identify as being either self-represented or not represented. And although the Legal Information Society plays a crucial role in the provision of legal information, they are increasingly being asked to provide information on legal processes, forms, and an array of justice system navigation that verges on the provision of legal advice. So through my work at the Equity Office of the Barrister Society, I've become acutely, acutely aware of the complexity of access to justice issues. And I personally interact frequently with individuals who struggle to access legal services that meet their particular legal needs. These strung, struggles range from issues relating to one or a combination of the following factors. Residence in a particular community, membership to a particular racial or cultural group, and of course, income. So there are some communities in Nova Scotia where you may have to travel over 100 kilometers to find a lawyer who can address your particular legal issue. For example, in a custody dispute in a small town involving a couple breaking up and a custody or access request from grandparents, it is not uncommon that one party may have to seek a lawyer from a community a number of kilometers away. When you factor in mobility and transportation issues, this can become a significant barrier to access. In Halifax, we are increasingly hearing of situations of non-English speaking clients unable to find lawyers who speak their language and struggling to find interpreters that they can afford and even in some cases that they feel they can trust. Members of our First Nations communities indicate that it is difficult to find legal services because so few lawyers are knowledgeable about Aboriginal law or the way in which Aboriginal law interacts with other areas of our law, such as family, criminal, and wills and estates. And in our African Nova Scotian community, clients are unable, often feel they're unable to retain a lawyer from their own communities, and um, have had significant challenges finding lawyers who understand uh, the historical and community complexities associated with the system of land grants that exist in the Preston communities and many other communities in the province. And of course, the affordability of legal services is one of the most significant barriers to access. In fact, the research undertaken in this province suggests that it is the working poor who generally don't qualify for legal aid and the middle class who face the greatest barriers. When this becomes particularly challenging is in the area of family law. A considerable number of Nova Scotians and lower income groups seek family services and despite really important advances in this area by legal aid, Dalhousie Legal Aid Service, the Department of Justice and the Legal Information Society, we're still seeing significant access issues. So it is these social conditions and a movement to consider access to justice in law societies across the country that has led us at the society to begin to work both internally and with other organizations and institutions to address access to justice issues and in particular to articulate our role or our specific responsibility in this area. Over the past few years at the society, we've embarked on a process to really to better understand our role. We've considered our purpose, which is to uphold and protect the public interest in the practice of law. And we've also examined our role in seeking to improve the administration of justice, which has a clearly articulated set of responsibilities under the new Section 4 2D of the Legal Professions Act. So some of the questions that we've grappled with have included, how does access to justice fit in with seeking to improve the administration of justice? What is our responsibility and what is the responsibility of other organizations and what responsibilities do we share and do we need to be working on together? And finally, given the scope and complexity of these issues, what are the parameters or, or limitations that we can or should place on our role? So through this process of self-examination on the part of the society, I've come to the following conclusions. Effective access to justice is a crucial outcome of a justice system that is well administered. And our specific responsibility is to improve the administration of legal services and to increase access to those services. But when I speak of legal services, the phrase should be understood broadly. 
to encompass more than simply access to lawyers, although I agree with Justice Cromwell that the, that is a crucial piece to this, but also a consideration of other possible ways that legal information and advice can be provided such as increasing publicly accessible legal information that includes inf information on processes and services, increased access to dispute resolution options, and a number of other considerations. In the Equity Office, we've been working on access and initiatives that specifically support historically disadvantaged communities through increasing diversity within the bar and extending re that representation to positions of power and influence. We've also begun to work closely with a number of communities to try to develop a richer culture of legal empowerment through access to legal information and knowledge. Although we're deeply committed to this work at the Society, we do recognize that we can't do it alone. And so there are many other organizations who share this responsibility. Therefore, we focus much, many of our efforts in the area of liaison and collaboration. We meet regularly with officials from the Department of Justice, community organizations, members of the judiciary, legal aid, the CBA, and others to discuss these issues and collaborate on programs and initiatives. So through this collaborative partnership, the Access to Justice Working Group was born. And this working group has taken responsibility for a number of, pro of projects, including the Access to Family Justice website that will be launched in April of this year. So this website, which was, which was sort of conceived through a collaborative partnership with, a num with all of these organizations, is designed to be a central hub for family law information, processes, and services in Nova Scotia, and to reduce unnecessary duplication or complication within the family law system. It's our hope that this project will help people dealing with a family law issue to understand and navigate court processes, and that it will also offer a number of alternatives to court to help people solve disputes themselves. Through this working group, we've also built a comprehensive access to justice database that pro profiles all of the access to justice um, projects and initiatives that, that um, exist within this province. The, this online searchable database will hopefully be linked to Nova Scotia 211, which is set to launch in the fall. Nova Scotia 211, for those of you who aren't aware, um, is a telephone triage service designed to quickly link Nova Scotians to information and service they need in a number of sectors. So it include, that includes health and social services, but it also includes the justice sector. We've also supported the Legal Information Society with its pro bono initiative, which will provide a series of summary advice clinics situated around the province. And finally, as I indicated earlier, we've embarked on a number of initiatives designed to meet the needs of historically disadvantaged communities. Through the use of volunteer lawyers, we provide legal information sessions to new Canadians, Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities, and we're planning a symposium in June to begin to address the challenges faced by rural women when trying to access legal services. And our Rural Practices Working Group is dedicated to addressing the particular access challenges facing rural communities. So despite these significant efforts and the important work of a number of other organizations in the province, the re reality remains that large sectors of our population are unable to afford and or access a lawyer or any other service to help them solve their legal disputes. So in reality, I think we actually still do have a very long way to go. And I believe that access to justice will remain a growing problem Unless we're willing to start thinking outside the narrow box that currently seems to include only lawyers and courts and start to envision an entirely different way of doing things in the future. So in relation to legal services, this will require a willingness to consider a range of possibilities that will increase the public's knowledge and confidence in their abilities to work through legal issues themselves. These may include comprehensive legal web uh, sites or other technologies access to legal information in schools and community centers, or empowering frontline workers and service providers to pro provide much needed navigation through legal services. We will also require, it, it will also require that we improve access to lawyers by considering a range of strategies, such as unbundling legal services or limited scope retainers, which is the concept that per, we would permit lawyers to provide limited representation to a client by taking only a part of a client's legal matter. Increasing access to le legal aid services, cultural competence education, developing technologies that help lawyers to, in urban centers to provide advice to remote rural communities that may not have access to lawyers, 
and being open to the possibility of other professionals, such as paralegals, possibly social workers, counselors, or others, playing some role in the provision of these services. Specifically, social workers and counselors um, could play a role in family law processes, where we are already moving away from a purely adversarial model and have begun to see much more use of collaborative family law, family group conferencing, case conferencing, conciliation, mediation, and other dispute resolution processes. Many family lawyers have indicated that dispute resolution processes have proven to be very successful. They are quicker often and more efficient and, some, and have the added benefit of freeing up court time so that other uh, for other matters and increasing access to cl for clients to other types of services. So generally speaking, I think we need to start shifting away from our reliance on the traditional ways of practicing law and just opening ourselves up to start to consider some of the other options that are out there. In Nova Scotia, for example, we're seeing considerable success with a restorative approach to addressing conflict and harm. Restorative justice has been successfully implemented throughout the province to address youth and even in some regions, regions, adult criminal matters. And this has proven to reduce recidivism and successfully decrease the number of young people being processed through the court system. The Human Rights Commission has recently adopted a restorative approach to repair relationships and offer faster solutions to complaints. The possibilities in this area are significant and remain to be developed. So although I think I've named a number of examples, I really only just scratched the surface. There are many options and possible directions that we could take. And of course, I'm not suggesting that we can or will take on all of these activities in Nova Scotia. But we do not need to start thinking about the possibilities. Because I believe that with open minds, consultation with the communities in this province, and a little creativity, it is possibly to possible to dramatically change the way Nova Scotians understand, access, and interact with legal services. Of course, we do need to be sure these services will be delivered in a competent and ethical manner. But I believe that this can be done and should not limit our thinking at this stage. Change is necessary because the demand for legal services in, is increasing and we know that at, at the society that the numbers of lawyers in this province is remaining static and has for many years and we are concerned that it could decline. We can't expect the legal profession as it currently exists to be able to fill this gap on its own and so we need to start thinking of these other options, possibilities and opportunities in this area. To close, I just want to tell you a brief story. A few weeks ago, my son fell at daycare. Later that night, he complained of pains in his chest, and it was about 7 p.m. on a Thursday night, and there was no way to reach our family doctor. So I went online. And the first thing I th came up with was an excellent website on Nova Scotia 811. I then used their telephone helpline, and within 15 minutes, I was speaking to a nurse who asked me a number of questions about his pain and his breathing, and on this basis recommended we see a doctor as soon as possible. 40 minutes later, we were in a doctor's office at a walk-in clinic not far from my home. This doctor gave us some recommendations to address the issue and told us if the symptoms didn't clear up to see our family doctor early the next week. The symptoms did in fact clear up and we did not have to visit our doctor. But the point I want to make in bringing forward this story is that we did receive straightforward, excellent advice quickly and efficiently and we didn't bog down the hospital system or cram into our doctor's waiting room for hours. In my experience, this was the medical system at its best. And this success was accomplished because the players within the system, including the doctors and nurses, were willing to start to extend the scope of their service, services and offer these services in a variety of different formats. So now, imagine if these options were available for legal services. First, a reliable, comprehensive website that would allow you to gain the information you need to better understand your legal issue, and also to point you in the direction of the processes and services needed to begin finding solutions. This website could be connected to a phone line, which would be manned by a legal professional who could help you understand the severity and urgency of your legal issue, and provide you with options and possibly solutions. And finally, if need be, you could go to a drop-in clinic where a lawyer could offer you 15 or 20 minute sessions to identify your problem, provide you with possible things you could do to address this issue yourself, or if necessary, recommend you retain a lawyer. These types of options, and of course, an endless array of other possibilities, is where our future lies.
Thank you, Emma. Professor Trevor Farrow teaches at uh, Osgood Hall Law School, York University, in several areas, including professional ethics and responsibility. He's the chair of the Canadian Forum on Civil Justice, one of the organizations which participates in the, the action committee that Justice Cromwell told us about. He's a member of the action committee and also a member of the uh, uh, court uh, process simplification working group, which is one of the groups that uh, will be reporting this spring. Uh, uh, Trevor will uh, speak to us about the uh, importance of the work we're discussing, uh, the importance of access to legal services, uh, an assessment of, of where we are, and the costs if we fail to meet this challenge. Never fails. Whenever I need to answer an answer to a question, ask Richard Devlin. <laughs> um, and then the was <laughs> I've got to say it's a real honor to be part of uh, this Wickwire session um, with my uh, co-panelists. Um, it's a real delight to be back here in Halifax uh, and at Dalhousie. I want to thank the dean um, and uh, and Professor and uh, Devlin and all the folks who have who have. Uh, organize this, this session. Um, I also want to say it's a real treat to be in the company of some of my former professors, Professors Evans and Archibald. Um, uh, great to be back here. Um, so the, the title of, the, of our panel today is Access to Justice, Reality, Rhetoric, um, or Recommitment. I still haven't figured out whether I'm reality, rhetoric, or recommitment. Um, I think it might be rhetoric that's left after the last two <laughs> sessions. Um, it's a big topic, and there's many ways to look at access to justice. What I'm going to try and do um, in a relatively brief time is to look at four things. I'm going to come back to the question that Justice Cromwell started with, with this question is, what is access to justice? I'm then going to look at uh, the question of how are we doing with access to justice? The third thing I want to touch on is a, a, a particular issue that I, I think we can focus on, part of the engagement of, of how to deal with this. And then the fourth uh, part of the, uh, uh, of the session will be to take a look at what, do we, what is it cost not to do this or um, uh, of not making justice accessible. So to turn to the first issue, what is access to justice? And I think the first thing we need to do is to take up the invitation, um, both from Justice Cromwell and, and, and Emma, to think broadly. And I want to spend a little bit of time thinking broadly for a minute. Um, and I think we need to first look at the question is, what's the purpose of law? Uh, which, is a, which is a conversation that we have in different ways, certainly in this, in this kind of environment. And I think Put simply, the purpose of law is to assist with the creation or the attainment of a just and flourishing society. Okay? Um, and the idea of the good life, which citizens, our clients, folks are pursuing, um, is at the core of what I think of as of the public interest. Okay? And so the notion of justice or the idea of justice really, I think, is the attainment of that just and flourishing society. So therefore, the purpose of law, if we look at that, is to help achieve that notion of justice in the form of the good life. And I think there's an individual and I think there's a collective aspect to this conversation. There's an individual aspect to it in a rights-based, freedom-seeking society. But I also think there's a very important collective aspect to this idea of the good life or the public interest, particularly in highly interdependent, globalized communities that we live in. So, if we, if we think that that's what the purpose of law is, then what, is, what about access to justice? And so the, I think access to justice has to be bound up in this idea of access to the good life. And I think it's, it's very much a conversation that resonates um, with what a lot of ethicists have been looking pre and post the Enlightenment for, 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 for generations. And it's an aspirational idea about what members of the public um, are looking for. They're the badges of citizenship, their housing, their food, their bus passes, their, their nannies, their fair working conditions, their equality in the workplace and in the hallways of where we work and live um, and operate. 
I think that's the kind of justice that our clients and the public actually really care about um, when we're thinking about this topic of access to justice. So if we, if we think, if we come back to the topic of today, access to justice, I think it includes the subset, the very important subset of access to legal services, courts, judges, et cetera, a, a number of things that we're gonna be talking about. All of these things are important, they're all good things, but they're not ends in themselves. They're steps along the process, I think, to the broader, more aspirational notion of what we're looking for as citizens in the community. And I think if we look at our own role, we are steps along that process to the attainment of that just good life. So I wanna take seriously that invitation that Justice Cromwell started us off with on thinking broadly. Second question, how are we doing? And I think there's, um, you know, there's no secret there's, that there's a growing disconnect, discontent generally in society uh, in terms of where are things at. And maybe I'll start first with um, a statement from the Occupy movement. There has been a theft by the 1% of our democ democratic ability to shape and form the society in which we live and our society is steered toward the destructive purpose pursuit of consumption, profit, and greed at the expense of all else. What else are people saying? If we look at Richard Branson's new book, the short-term focus on profit has driven most businesses to forget about the long-term role in taking care of people. Now, of course, this, this quick look at the broad sort of societal level of how, we, how we're doing, it's a tough hill to climb. We can't, as lawyers, fix everything. But I think we need not to lose sight of the fact that there is a connection between the disconnect, dis, sorry, discontent in society generally and I think the growing discontent that people are feeling with an increasingly inaccessible justice system. Okay, so what about that legal system? And let's take a look at that. And I think there's, no, there's certainly no lack of statements on how we're doing there, and I'm sorry to say that this is not the feel-good moment of the session. We're not doing that well. So where are we gonna start? And I think we can look at, uh, we can start with the World Justice Project, the 2011 Rule of Law Index which ranked us 16 out of 23 of the high income countries indexed this year in terms of access to justice, okay? Um, which was seen uh, around the community as quite frankly, not that good. So now the test uh, for the moment, for those of you that thought you were gonna come and sit and listen, um, the next three slides you need to engage with. So I wanna ask you um, th this question, on a critique of our current state of access to justice, who said this? Horror stories abound about the many Canadians who do not have access to the legal profession and therefore cannot protect their rights, not only in the criminal sphere but also in the civil sphere. Although the Canadian legal profession has expressed significant concern, in general its response has been inadequate. Anyone know? Uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin. Um, it's, a, it's a terrific guess and I did have a slide from her but I chose to replace it with... Um, <laughs> so let's try another person if we don't like that authority. <laughs> Who said this? Does the legal profession recognize just how large a problem there is with access to justice? I have serious concerns that we have hit the iceberg but are being too slow to recognize the seriousness of the damage or the threat to the integrity of the structure that the collision has caused. The problem is real and growing. Anyone know who said that? <laughs> Justice Cromwell. All right, third, just for fun. This one might be a little easier, but for a, a, a warm afternoon, let me just go back to uh, the November, uh, cold November foggy days uh, of, of yonder year. The High Court of Chancery where members of the bar are engaged in one of the of 10,000 stages of an endless cause, tripping one another up on slippery precedents, groping knee-deep in technicalities, making a pretense of equity with bills, cross bills, answers, rejoinders, injunctions, affidavit issues, and mountains of costly nonsense. As I drop my water. This is the court of chancery which gives to the moneyed might the means abundantly of wearing out the right which so exhausts finances, patience, courage, hope, 
so overthrows the brain and breaks the heart that there is not an honorable man among its practitioners who would not give the warning, suffer any wrong that can be done you rather than come here. On the 200th anniversary, it seemed appropriate. Um, so that's a bit of a tour through how are we doing right now? And I don't think it's an unfair tour, uh, notwithstanding some good efforts that we're, that we're, that we're getting into. Um, and I think aggravating this problem is that not all inaccessibility is created equal. Um, unfortunately, the inaccessibility visits itself more on a number of groups. Um, one recent study talked about at least 70 to 90 percent of legal problems never even make it to, uh, to, to legal help. And of the folks that have those problems, most of them, more than 50 percent, are self-represented litigants or dealing with these problems themselves. Emma talked about some of this. Um, it's typically the marginalized groups and the folks who have the least resources who are dealing with these challenging issues. And there are particular areas of, of concern, uh, family law that we've heard of a, a number of times, um, and other areas that often also visit themselves more heavily on low and increasingly uh, marginalized uh, groups. The result is that law is becoming in, in, increasingly inaccessible and to an alienating of those for whom it was meant to serve. It's quite frankly an unsustainable situation. People don't understand law, they don't want it, they can't afford it, and they're starting to look for answers elsewhere. So what do we do about that? And when we were preparing for this panel, Justice Cromwell uh, sort of laid down the gauntlet, I don't know if you remember this, but basically said, not so much talk, let's get action, and if you had one thing you wanted to focus on, what would be that problem and what might be the solution? Well, I took his invitation seriously, partly because it's hard to turn down a question from a Supreme Court judge. <laughs> um, but there are many, there are many issues, um, but the one challenge I want to take up is that I think there is a culture, and this is a bit of a challenge, it's a bit of a, a, a confrontational statement, but I think there is a con culture of non-accountability within the profession. There's a culture of moral and social disconnect and non-accountability. Now, of course, most lawyers, I think, work hard. They're good people. They want to do good things. But at the end of the day, lawyers are of the view, ultimately, that ours is not the bidding of society, but it's the bidding of our clients, of our fee-paying clients. So where do I go for authority for this? And we could go all over the place. But if we go back to the recently amended code here in this province, which is similar to the codes across the country, we see a familiar statement. The lawyer has a duty to the client to raise fearlessly every issue, advance every argument, and ask every question, <laughs> however distasteful, that the lawyer thinks will help the client's case and to endeavor to obtain for the client the benefit of every remedy and defense, defense authorized by law. However distasteful. Actually, my favorite was the similar provision in Alberta that came off the books recently with the new Federations Code that said what the lawyer thinks about her client's case is essentially irrelevant. Um, it's a culture that is it's convenient, it's familiar, and unfortunately it's hidden behind some very important, some good meaning, but some problematic uh, themes, such as clients' rights, freedom, zealous advocacy, Etc. And we find ourselves as lawyers using this. Now, of course, clients are entitled to their legal services. I'm not saying anything about that. But the result is that lawyers are starting to avoid the messy results and implications of their work and the moral implications and the ethical implications under the guise of saying, I'm simply the lawyer. It's my client's uh, retainer, however distasteful. The result of that, though, individually, is that clients with money and power are driving the public agenda, and collectively, the system is becoming increasingly inaccessible, unfair, and it's imploding. So the nice, tight theory that we're operating under, operating under um, is, I think, not just the solution, but it's starting to become the cause of the problem. Um, so I'm conscious of the time, and I think what I want to do is, is, is stop on that moment and just say, I think, as, as lawyers, we wanted to ask ourselves, are we part of the problem, or are we going to become part of the solution? 
And I think it's time to stop saying we don't have the power of the room in the room because increasingly the folks who are wielding the power in the room, I think, are, are um, not so much the clients but the people who they're retaining. Um, and I look to, uh, to Roberto Unger for support for this when I say that in the relatively de-energized democracies of today, much of the controversy over the basic structure of social life, which is driven out from the arena of government politics, passes into the hands of the professions. That's us. The power of, the, of what happens in society is passing into our hands under the guise of technical expertise. It matters how we relate to the citizenry and how the discourse and practice of each profession suppresses or exhibits transformative opportunity in social life. Put simply, we have the power in the room really to make a difference, and I think we need to start realizing that. Um, we've made a number of promises to do so, and they're familiar to the room, so I can be very quick. Uh, going back to our codes of conduct, um, that we, we promise to operate in the public interest. I look to the, the constating document in my province, um, which is not typically the beacon of progressivism, particularly these days, um, but when I look at our Law Society Act, we as a group of lawyers in Ontario promise to uh, advance the cause of justice and the rule of law, to facilitate access to justice, and to protect the public interest. That's the deal we've made. Um, and, and, and it's nice that we've got this rhetoric. I think what's the problem is we're not making good on our promise. And so the culture shift that I'm asking for is, is or the, the, the problem is, is the disengagement. And so the solution to take up Justice Cromwell is a culture shift. And it's a serious culture shift because I think we can tweak with rules, we can look at systems, and we can look at institutional change. But if we're not behind it ourselves, we're not going to get very far. And I think many of you in the room are probably familiar with the statement, particularly from students, we'd love to make a difference, that's why we came to law school, but what's it like in the real world? Because what I hear is I have to follow the senior partner, I've got to do what my client says, and what I think about this case doesn't matter. And I think that's where I have my one wish list for the day. I think we could really focus our energies, and we do have the power to engage with that issue uh, in this room. So my final point, what's the cost of not doing this? And I think the cost is high. Um, legal, legal problems cluster, particularly at the low and middle income uh, spectrum of, the, of, of society. Related social problems come up. So what do I mean by that? And let's take a quick example. Dad loses his job. It becomes a social assistance issue. There's pressure at home. Domestic violence uh, uh, ensues. There's abuse. There's family breakdown. Problems for kids at school. Substance abuse. Further substance abuse, and the cycle continues. And so the idea is that legal problems at the front end, if they're solved early, can do a significant, um, make a significant difference at that back end of clustering legal problems that do uh, come up if we don't get at the issues early on. And I think we need to see that as the ultimate spectrum of access to justice issues. It's not just the one-off issues at the front end, it's the clustering of these problems that then create further problems um, in that notion of the good life, which put on its head becomes very much the notion of the bad life. If you want to look at it in economic terms, it makes huge sense. There's a social welfare benefit of doing this. There's an economic benefit to governments and to society about spending a dollar early in order to save 10 later. Um, and it makes good practical sense for lawyers because if we don't do something about it, at some point someone's going to say, stop the hemorrhaging, we've got to look for a different model. And that, Justice Cromwell raised this cost of justice project, and I won't spend much time on it, I'm happy to take questions later, but the idea of this cost of justice project that we've got, it's a five-year project really to look at two questions. What does it cost to deliver good, accessible justice? And on the flip side, what does it cost if we don't deliver good and accessible justice? And really pushing more to a medical model of the cost-benefit analysis of early intervention. To use Richard Susskind, we'd much rather have a fence at the top of the hill than an ambulance at the bottom. And I think we need to start thinking seriously and smartly about how we spend our dollars, um, because that's really what we're talking about. Um, my time's up, so on, on, 
in my conclusion of this paper, I've, I've raised a, num a number of issues, but really the point I want to leave you with is this. It's an aspirational notion of justice. It's an aspirational notion of access. And then it's a look in the mirror notion of how do we engage and take up this issue of what we can do. And I think it's not just rhetoric to recommit to this. I think we actually have to say to ourselves, are we in this for the long haul or not? And if so, it's time to really put our money and our actions where our mouths are. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Now uh, Richard acts as the roadie for us. To... panelists for three excellent and interesting uh, presentations. Let's, let me start by uh, asking if any of them has any comments they'd like to add now, perhaps in response to something that one of the other panelists has said. I saw Justice Cromwell curiously making notes as uh, the other speakers. I'd just like to say to Emma, she was right about the brilliance and funny and the order. And <laughs> <laughs> never live that down, never. <laughs> Uh, two thoughts. One, uh, rising out of Trevor's talk, I mean, I, Trevor, I think I, I get your point about the uh, sort of mindless adversarialism. But on the other hand, I think we don't want to lose our commitment to fearless, courageous advocacy because I think it's needed. It may not be needed in some of the places where you were referring to it, but I, I would, would hate the bar to lose that independence and courage that can be a voice for people who otherwise wouldn't have a, a voice. Um, and in response, really arising out of Emma's talk, I just think that the importance of technology in, in access to justice can't be underestimated. Mm -hmm. I know when I was on the Court of Appeal here, we had about a fifth of our files had at least one self-represented person. I see Chief Justice MacDonald uh, nodding. and. Um, you know, the, the, the people who would come to court didn't fit the sort of stereotype you might have of self-represented litigants if you didn't have a lot of first-hand experience. And the vast majority of those people had access to the internet, and most of them used it and would say, boy, did we ever find that uh, web resource that you've mounted on how to prosecute an appeal. Or, I you know, Annette Boucher, when she was registrar of the court, did a, a presentation for paralegals, legal assistance on how to put an appeal book together, which was then videotaped and mounted on the web, accessible on the website. And the number of self-reps that would say, we watched um, Ms. Boucher's presentation, we think we've got this figured out. So uh, I really think that the whole technology piece of this can be huge, and it can be pretty low cost uh, once you do the upfront work. So just two reflections on, on arising out of your talks, which I thought were terrific. I think the one thing I just wanted to comment, I, actually I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear the, the, the floor, the questions from the floor, so I'll be very brief, but I do think that um, picking up on Emma's sort of menu of options that they're looking at, and Justice Cromwell and I were talking with Emma ahead of time, I do think that looking at the, the solutions to access to justice as a menu of options, and then taking up your, your point, Justice Cromwell, about where can I engage or where can we engage on those moments, I think it's really the only way we can think about this, as opposed to some kind of universal solution to this. So um, I thought that was very helpful. The panel is uh, open for questions from the floor. Have we any questions? Yes, up, up back. Um, one thing I'd like to hear the panel address is uh, maybe the issue of a numbers game, that the profession has to the number of law school spots, and lawyers itself have to really kept pace with the growth of the Canadian population. And this might be a major reason why I block a lot of trouble finding lawyers. Uh, was there a shortage of lawyers? 
I'll, I'll be quick, and, and, and Dean probably has the, probably has the best answer on this. But um, I think it's a, it, it is a, it's a it's it's a really good question, and I think um, uh, there's actually more lawyers coming in than we may think. Although I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but there's a huge number of lawyers coming in from overseas. Canadians going elsewhere, others coming here um, through the national committees on accreditation and the, and the process of sort of licensing lawyers. So we've got a set of seats in Canada and we've got an increasing number of seats elsewhere. One of the interesting conversations that's happening right now, particularly in Ontario, is there's a, there's a, 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 a gate to go through which is article. Different jurisdictions do that differently. But one of the bottlenecks for increasing the number of lawyers, certainly in Ontario, and I think starting elsewhere, um, is the articling process. And so we're really struggling with how to increase the numbers from a regulatory perspective in order to address access, while at the same time, you know, keeping a level of quality and what have you. But, uh, I don't have any solutions to, your, to the impact of your question, but I know that it's one that the different bar societies are looking at seriously right now, and articling seems to be the big bottleneck. Yeah, I would um, agree with that comment. I think I don't think there's a shortage of lawyers coming into law school or, or students coming into law school, but we are seeing less, fewer numbers, um, you know, uh, getting articling positions, and and then we're also seeing shorter, no, fewer numbers at higher back. And I mean, uh, my, you know, my over the last few years since about 2008, that's really been consistent at, at least, perhaps before that. So. Um, there, you know, and, and often that cited as economic conditions and so on. It's it's, tri it's challenging, but um, that's the reality we're seeing. And as I said previously, we are not seeing a, a growth in the lawyers in the uh, who are members of the bar um, in Nova Scotia right now. So that does play a role, definite, definitely. Um, and we are, you know, some of the things I've. I've spoke up, I think, um, and sort of thinking differently, maybe even about how we uh, um, look at articles, thinking about, we have a rural practices group, so we are seeing a, shorter, a, a significant shortage of lawyers in rural Nova Scotia, for example, that's come up on a number of occasions, lots of discussion around that, so how we sort of feed the students coming out of school into rural communities and, and create those relationships um, has been a, is certainly a priority for us. So uh, this past year there was a conference that dealt with that issue and sort of um, trying to look at, at really identifying where are the most significant ga gaps in lawyers and how do we ensure that the students actually get there um, because that's what we're seeing as an issue. Yeah. Just to add a quick word, the. Uh, in terms of the absolute numbers, I don't know what the answer is to that question of how many lawyers optimally there ought to be. But I think there are distribution issues, as Emma mentioned. And so, for example, in Manitoba, the Law Society, as I understand it, is helping students from rural communities where there's a shortage of access to legal services. Is that the Law Society is actually assisting them? with the cost of their legal education in exchange for an undertaking to go back to their hometowns and practice law. Something similar that we were doing with doctors uh, in Nova Scotia 30 years ago. Um, so that's one piece of the puzzle. I think another piece may be uh, uh, modes of practice that I think there's probably a lot of work to be done on helping people access a mode of practice that's satisfying for them but also fills a, a gap in the access to legal services. I was chatting at lunch uh, about a, a, one example in, in Alberta where a couple have opened a, a block fee family law only practice and they will do each aspect of a family law file on a block fee basis. That's all they do. They've taken full advantage of technology to make the practice very efficient. And a lot of people who previously were not seeking professional legal help are going to them. They are, by all reports, making a good living and filling a need in the community. So that in addition to the problem of what's the ratio of lawyers to the population, which I really don't have a handle on, I think there are issues of distribution and also issues of how the services are made available. Up here. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the mandatory pro bono, uh, having a system in which lawyers can choose to either provide any kind of legal services or uh, paying for funds to expand the way. Don't say verses. 
president should answer. Yeah. Um, my fun one, man. Uh, so I, I, we've done a lot of work, and I think we need to continue to do work to f figure out models of pro bono um, and to increase pro bono. Um, what we do know is that there is currently quite a bit of pro bono happening, but you know, but there isn't um, a, a, any kind of process by which you can. In, um, engage in pro bono through any kind of formalized program here in Nova Scotia. That does exist in other provinces. Um, whether I personally think it, sh it should be mandatory, I'm, I'm actually not sure right now what, the answer, what, what I feel on that. I haven't really looked at that issue enough or whether in an ideal world we, that wouldn't be required. In fact, that if we could create a, a formalized system and we could sort of in, in, seek the type of engagement that um, I think we've talked about today, that in fact we would see a number of, of lawyers and um, really jumping at the opportunity to take on pro bono. And about in 2009, I, I worked with a number of other, a couple of other um, colleagues on a study into pro bono services provision in the province. And what we found from that study is that. Um, um, there were, was a real interest in pro bono, particularly um, from newer lawyers um, and law students indicating that this was something that they would want, they wanted to prioritize. But what we, w we were seeing is that actually, actually finding ways to um, carry out their whatever type of pro bono that they wanted to carry out or, or the types of um, cases they wanted to take on pro bono, there was no access for them to actually find those clients and so on. Um, and there wasn't um, necessarily any overall support, um, whether that was from firms or from the bar, or um, it wasn't, there wasn't support, but there was no acknowledged support at that time, and that, that was a real barrier. So I, you know, before I would go down the road of mandatory, I think I would want us to explore those options of what kinds of programs could we put in place that would really make it appealing, how could we make um, it seem it an asset for law firms to, to really have a formalized pro bono program, how would we look at that? And I think that's the direction we need to be going in this province. Um, I, I did mention that the Legal Information Society um, has the uh, project underway. They've just started it uh, this year. Uh, they received uh, funding for the next few years to, to implement a formalized pro bono project, starting with summary advice legal clinics. Um, and so um, that's sort of the first step, I would say, in, 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 in taking that on. And I hope from there we see real growth in, in the area of pro bono. Two very quick points. One is if you're interested, uh, Professor Devlin wrote a terrific article on this a number of years ago. You may have seen it. Um, but And the second point, I think one of the arguments against mandatory pro bono is it's not fair on lawyers. And I do know that there are lawyers who it's it harder on than others, small firms, small sole practitioners, rural lawyers, and what have you. But I think we also need to remember that we've got a, uh, what I would view anyway as a perfect monopoly to practice law. And we, we've promised to society that in return for um, being the only game in town, we've, we've, there's some conditions. And one of them is providing access to justice. And I think it's, it's one of many menu items. So I don't think pro bono is at all the solution, but I think it's certainly one of the menu items. And I would not be um, sad at all to see a mandatory pro bono um, uh, requirement uh, across the board, but I know it's not uncontroversial. Just two quick thoughts. One is I think my law partners would be the first to tell you that I did a lot of pro bono before it was invented. Uh, we called it receivables. <laughs> <laughs> I think I even paid tax on some of it. But, uh, but I think there is a, a sort of a structural issue to think about with um, so mandatory pro bono. I mean, in, you have to think about the solicitor and client relationship. And while they're, of course, they're the ethical obligations, of course, but in a solicitor and client, traditional solicitor and client relationship, there is an element of accountability because you're going to be looking to the person to whom you're providing the services to pay your bill when you're finished or along the way. If you have a, somebody who didn't want to be doing the work in the first place without the accountability of the financial relationship, I guess I just worry about the nature of that solicitor and client relationship. If you, if you had sort of a volunteer army uh, that didn't want to be in the battle in the first place, I'd be a little worried about how hard they might be fighting for the, for the client. Good question. I think you might. Do you want to follow up? Go ahead. In terms of the, the structural problems, I mean, as I was saying, that you can either have 
in-kind services, but for many people, it's not realistic to donate those uh, services or don't want to make that choice. You can simply pay into the fund, which would go to expand the place. And you wouldn't have the issue of conflicts or, or, or other issues that I think at times at smaller terms, and that, that sort of do all things with a balance of the structural problems. I think that's certainly a good option if that's the route that, that we're to go. I mean, I think there's a lot of lawyers doing lots of pro bono work, and there's lots of people that want to do it, So, um, but that's certainly one option, I think, if mandatory were put in place. I just want to put in a plug for the Nova Scotia Law Reform Commission, but also to pick up on a point that Tom Cromwell made about the whole business of access to justice being a real sinkhole. We're doing a study on the enforcement of civil judgments. Now, we've talked about people trying to get into the courthouse, but once you get your judgment, people don't feel they get much justice if they can't enforce it. And the problem we're running into, of course, is that the Sheriff's Department is not funded properly enough. So it's going to cost more money for additional uh, personnel. Then you get into the, I guess it's a political question of whether you outsource some of the functions of the sheriff's office. All I'm saying is that these problems we're dealing with are not small ones, and they occur both at the front end of the system and at the back end, too. My second comment, and maybe it's a question. I was on one of these civil justice uh, studies in Nova Scotia. One of the big problems that we ran into was lawyers taking advantage of the discovery rules to uh, ask all kinds of what might be considered irrelevant questions in order to run up the hours. Now, I have no problem with lawyers taking up unpopular causes. I'm just wondering if there's an ethical question here for the bar about lawyers who can't resist the temptation to uh, make a little extra money by doing more than they really need to do. I just wonder if the panel would like to comment on that. I, I, I think there's enough, I, it, it's, I'll, I'll focus on this, the, the second point. Um, I very much think that the connection between rules of civil procedure and rules of professional conduct is coming closer and closer. If, it were, if, there, if there was ever a difference, I think the difference has to be eliminated because um, how you practice law, I think, is all about what you're practicing. Um, of course, the rules committees in various provinces have been looking at this issue, rules of proportionality, r rules of efficiency, redoing discovery rules and what have you. So there's some effort been done, significant effort, to address some of that uh, uh, abuse. Um, and some efforts on case management or what have you. But I also think, quite frankly, um, that it's, it's part of this commitment to a new professionalism, that um, particularly if you have a client that wants to beat up on the other side, um, I think that's where the role of the council comes in and says, and, and there are good counsel who already do this, but instilling that right from the start in the idea of lawyers are not simply a mouthpiece. And we say that, but it's amazing how we don't, the, the resonance of that statement doesn't really follow through, um, particularly at the early, early stage of the bar. I think lots of young lawyers don't have the courage to stand up to their clients and certainly to their senior partners. And so these are the moments on the day-to-day -day practice where I think all lawyers have to stand up and say, this is part of the bigger good of the justice system. Just, just a couple of thoughts, uh, Bill. One is that, um, while I, I, I think you've obviously raised an important uh, and valid point, I think we also have to... Was it brilliant? Oh. I beg your pardon? Was it brilliant? It, was it, really I, it wasn't funny. <laughs> 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 but the, uh, I think we, we can't ever forget the other side of that, is that you know, law, uh, clients are consumers, and if things turn out badly, as they generally do for at least one side, um, a lot of questions get asked about, well, why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that? I know Dan has lots of experience in the representing lawyers who have uh, 
run afoul of various things or allegedly run afoul of various things. And so we can't forget about the, the, the pressure on the lawyer to, on the one hand, exercise good professional judgment and practice in an ethical way, but also has to, we have to at least recognize the pressures that there may be there from uh, potential professional liability. Um, the second thing is that, you know, over the last 30 years, we've moved to a, really creating a lot of judicial intervention in the solicitor and client relationship. I mean, the whole move towards case management in the courts throughout North America, certainly, in part is driven by the concern that lawyers without some direction or some limit setting run amok in various ways, uh, some of which you've described. But that also gives rise to its own set of issues about, you know, is the, is the heavy, is the judicial management hand too heavy? Is a judge well equipped for that management role? So I come back to an important component of legal practice is the exercise of good judgment. And that is essential in a very ethical context. And I think that if you have that strong uh, base, many of the concerns that you've raised wouldn't be present, but they're certainly real, and I don't see a quick or easy fix for them. But I'd really be interested in Dan's, Dan's view. Well, I, uh, I thought uh, Justice Cromwell was referring to my experience in uh, clients second-guessing me after we lost. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell them about that. <laughs> No, no, uh, you, you're, you're quite correct, but the, 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 to differentiate between the lawyer who is uh, running up the hours for his own reasons and the lawyer who is being exceptionally diligent to avoid being second-guessed would be pretty difficult to show, but uh, it's, it, it, it could be a real problem. I mean, I think what's happened is that we've gone to a kind of a rationing, you know, we've designed rationing of procedure. We've gone increasingly to simplified procedures for cases under a certain monetary limit. We've imposed uh, limits on oral discovery uh, that didn't exist previously. And of course this is all kind of ironic because when I started in this business in the 70s, it, you know, the more discovery we had, the better it would all be. All the cases would settle, the trials would be more focused, etc. Fast forward 30 years, What's the big problem in civil litigation? Discovery run amok. So you know, we're, we're, it shows the kind of the cyclical nature of the of the problem. And there are a few. in a society where everybody wants perfection. And there are a few of us in this room who are old enough to remember when a four-day trial was a long trial. Well, I, I can tell you, I did two criminal jury trials in three days when I was called to the bar in 1979. You were crazy. <laughs> no, I had a very guilty guy. <laughs> further, further questions? Have we had? Right I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has thought about uh, the nature of regulation of lawyers and whether it has any bearing on access to justice. So is there any evidence from other jurisdictions that lawyers are not self-regulated that would say that access to justice issues are lessened or increased? Any relationship there? I can't uh, answer the question directly, but I can go back to the World Justice Index that that uh, Trevor referred to in his remarks. And if I remember well, and Trevor, you'd probably be able to correct me on this, but if I remember well, the top countries uh, in access to civil justice were all European countries where the structure of the legal profession and indeed the structure of the court system is very different than what we have. And perhaps, Trevor, you could, could fill in some of the details on that. Um, well, you're, you're exactly right. I can tell you that uh, just out of interest, Australia, Austria, Belgium, Estonia, Germany, then some of the Asian countries, Hong Kong, Japan, um, and then back to Europe. Uh, so it was very much um, your largely European focus ahead, um, uh, which I attribute a lead, There's a number of things I think that I attribute that to, um, different traditions and what have you. I do think, though, that we're going to see, and, and I don't have an answer to the question, is the first thing, I, and maybe Richard, who's done some work in, in the sort of deregulation, does, but I do think 
that we're going to see uh, uh, market forces coming to play in a different way than we uh, might see them here. Um, where we, and I'm not suggesting that we need to, to, to get rid of self-regulation, but it will be interesting to watch those market forces at play when we see a different regulator um, and some of the services opened up. We're already seeing some of the services opened up in different parts of the country in terms of paralegals and what have you, and that's having an impact. Um, and my intuition is that, that uh, there will be a different uh, level of access um, and more providers and more access points. But I think that's a couple of years down the road. Here. I was just uh, wondering on the issue of market forces or uh, a kind of legal, legal insurance. Could that provide a future solution to problems faced by the middle class with access to justice? Or but if you comment about possible limitations that that might have or benefits? I can tell you that our access to the Legal Services Working Group is actively looking at legal services insurance, uh, both in its sort of traditional form and also in uh, the insurance model of trying to increase access to legal aid through an, more of an insurance-based model. Um, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I can tell you this much, that my understanding is that in the UK, about 50% of the people have legal services insurance, whereas in Canada, across Canada, it's about 2 or 3%. In Quebec, it's about 7%, I think, so that even within our country, there's quite a, a swing. And I think it's uh, got to be a piece of the puzzle, for sure, because we're not going to get a whole new infusion of resources into uh, the civil justice system in this country, as far as I can tell. So we're going to have to find ways of getting funds for people to have access. Karen, I wasn't very accurate in my wave before. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a, uh, a pop quiz question for the panel, but before I get to that, uh, <laughs> um, I guess one of the quotes that I, I always, uh, um, you know, perhaps in uh, my old age, I'll get it tattooed across my bicep like Angelina Jolie, and that is uh, from uh, the R versus Prosper case in terms of the poor are not constitutional castaways. And the other one, a quote from, uh, I think it was Judge Sturgis, uh, justice is open to the public in the same way as the Ritz Hotel. So I always thought that one kind of resonated. <laughs> but uh, this is my pop quiz. And if you know, don't answer. Just say I know. Uh, and I, I open it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that will come out. <laughs> I also uh, uh, throw it out to everybody here. And just as a, as a little bit of a hint, I am the... Uh, I work with Nova Scotia Legal Aid. I'm the executive director of Nova Scotia Legal Aid Commission. So uh, the question uh, for everybody, just put up the hand if you know, um, is uh, what does ALAPC stand for? That's what I thought. <laughs> it stands for the Association of Legal Aid Plans of Canada. And so um, my question then to the panel, perhaps uh, for some discussion, is uh, do you think that uh, legal aid has fallen off the radar in terms of this uh, discussion? I've often said that legal aid is access to justice in motion, and yet we see in terms of uh, federal government commitment uh, to legal aid plans nationally, um, a decline in that commitment in terms of resourcing. And yet we see very interesting studies that are coming from Australia and even from Texas uh, that uh, note the, uh, um, the net economic benefits of investing in legal aid, um, showing that you, you put a dollar into legal aid and it will generate net economic benefits of between $1.60 and 225 that's the Australian study. And the Texas study looks at it and uh, gives you a net economic benefit of $1, gives you almost $8 in return. So my question to you, do you think that uh, we're missing an opportunity to refocus on legal aid? Have we taken legal aid for granted? Are we overlooking its potential? And you know, you know the answer I want. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, 
I'm conscious of the time, so I'll be brief, but I really do think that we're missing the boat. There's a big issue there, though, right? Because there's not an appetite of public dollars going into the system at the moment. I disagree with that premise, so we could get into that conversation, because I do think it's a political question. Um, and there is not the political will to really fund the system. But like the question before with insurance, really a, a, essentially a public insurance scheme um, is what we're talking about, universal legal care, if you will. I mean, take it to its, its logical conclusion. I think there's all sorts of economic arguments that would support doing that, or at least making it more robust. Um, but I don't want to stand here and say, I think that's going to happen tomorrow. I think that's a tough political argument at the moment, but one I would support uh, going ahead. I can just say, Karen, that in terms of our work, legal aid is certainly not being uh, overlooked. Uh, the, the chair of our legal services working group is Mark Benton, who you would know. I did actually know the answer to your question. <laughs> and uh, uh, Melina Buckley, who is the author of the report for the CBA, which has worked tirelessly. I think Rowley's here. Rowley's written reports on this uh, for the CBA over the years. and. Um, an emphasis on legal aid, and Melina is a member of that uh, working group and chair of the CBA's Access to Justice Committee. So there's no way that legal aid uh, is being overlooked. In fact, uh, Dave Crossan, who's a highly regarded civil litigator and criminal lawyer in Vancouver, is chair of the BC Legal Services Society. He's actually requested to be part of our working group. So legal aid is front and center, but I think. The other piece of that is that if if we think the strategy is to just sort of stamp our feet and ask for more dough, we've been doing that for 30 years and it's worse now than when we started. So we have to get some other strategies, but they have to be strategies that are based on a legal aid system that functions for sure. And based on an economic construct too. It's not only the right thing to do, but it's the efficient thing to do. And that I think perhaps resonates with funders. Sometimes. <laughs> the only thing I would add, I mean, uh, the two, my two panelists certainly said it very well, but is just that in the Nova Scotia context, and, and absolutely without question, both you know the work of Dalhousie Legal Aid Service and Nova Scotia Legal Aid is uh, you know the thing moving us forward in the area of, of, of improving our access to justice, and it's not just the work I, I would say of providing services. Uh, legal lawyers for clients, but also innovation and, and thinking through, um, you know, other types of provision of, of legal information sessions and, um, you know, certainly um, poverty law, expansion in the area of poverty law, and absolutely should not be, and will, I, I hope, <laughs> will not be um, forgotten or not thought of. It's crucial to what, where we are here today, you know, so shall. Ladies and gentlemen, we're a few minutes past our advertised uh, stop time, so I think I'm going to close the, the questions. Uh, and on your behalf, thank our three excellent panelists and invite Professor Devlin to bring our proceedings to a conclusion. Thank you, Dan. And um, just very briefly, I want to sort of uh, wrap things up. I want to thank our three panelists. We've identified the, the challenges of the reality, the grim reality of access to justice. Uh, we've identified that we need to move beyond the rhetoric. And we've had three panelists, Justice Cromwell, Professor Farrell, and Ms. Halpern, who have actually shown a real commitment to working with access to justice. So on behalf of the Shirt School of Law, I want to thank them for spending the afternoon with us.